Africa. Um, welcome to England Against the State. This is a discussion inspired by the book and pamphlet of the same name, published in the late 1970s. My name is Dan Hind, I'm a fellow with the Democracy Collaborative, and I'll be the chair. Can I, can't hear. Okay. So, late 70s is a period of intense struggle over the nature of the state, it's the end of the welfare settlement um, that was being established by Labour after 1945. Since then, we've seen the Thatcherite state settlement established, which is coming under intense pressure. It's a state system that is highly fragmented, highly marketized. We live in very different conditions, so we're here to find out what we can learn from the struggle of the late 70s and what, what we can learn from more recent developments in southern Europe. And to do that, we're joined by an amazing panel. We have Hilary Wainwright, who's an author, activist, and fellow of the Transnational Institute. She's the author of many books, including Reclaim the State, and most recently, A New Politics from the Left. She's also a former state employee. Um, she's also a former state employee. She works at the GLC. Um, we also have Mark Sawatka, who's General Secretary of the Public and Commercial Services Union, the PCS. And we're very, very lucky to be joined by Ana Mendez de Andes, who works with Ahora Madrid, Madrid Now, which is a municipal party platform. And, the, and she's also the author of the Municipalist Gambit, forgive me. Um, she's joined us at the last minute to take the place of Francesca Bria, who can't make it. And I'm sure we'd all like to make her very welcome. And finally, we have uh, John McDonnell, who's also a former state employee for the Greater London Council and has been MP for Hayes and Harlington since 1997. He's a Shadow Chancellor and has been in and against the state for much of his working life. Um, if I may... I'd like to ask Hillary to start with some comments about the original context of the, the, the notion of in and against the state, what we've learned since then, and how we can think about reviving the socialist challenge of the late 70s and current conditions. Okay. Maybe I should stand up too. Anyway, um, okay, so I'll stand up. Firstly, um, Dan didn't mention that I'm also co-editor of Red Pepper magazine. <laughs> That, that's available from the fantastic bookshop in Liverpool, News From Nowhere, which is in the, um, in the, in the cafe, and also from the Red Pepper stall in uh, Constellations, I think. It's not quite as old as In and Against the State, but it is over 25 years old. Um, anyway, um, so, for first, it's just, it's just amazing that In and Against the State is back. Um, and it's, I mean, it's partly due to John, he keeps repeating it, <laughs> because in a way that's very much his position. Um, but I think it's also that, as Mark was just saying to me, fundamental questions don't go away. It's not that we've always been right since the 70s, far from it. Um, but it is that the, 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 um, the, the crisis of that, that era has not gone away. And with it, the need to both... Um, we need the state, but on the other hand, we need a different kind of state. And that's been and is continuing to be a big dilemma. I mean, basically, the pamphlet was, it was really a product of people who'd been involved in social movements uh, in the 60s, in 68, in particular the women's movement, but not only the women's movement, student movement, and then movements that kind of emerged in public institutions, in the communities, fighting around housing, uh, in, in the trade union movement, fighting for both better wages and conditions, but also for alternatives, like the Lucas Aerospace Workers Plan that we heard about on Sunday. And these people found themselves often as state workers, but in this situation where, on the one hand, they needed and supported the public resources that the state represented, but on the other hand, felt totally alienated from the, the social relations of the state. So the whole emphasis was on the seeing of the state as, as, as social relations 
as, as social relations that could be changed, that the lesson of the women's movement, that we reproduce the oppressions and exploitations of capitalist society unless we refuse. And so in a way, Women Against the State was the first movement of refusal and thinking about how we can create alternatives. Many of those people, and certainly people inspired by that pamphlet, like me, like John, found ourselves, I mean, John as an elected politician, me as a, a mere local, we were called local government officers, you know, which was sort of summed up what, the, what, what local government was like and the GLC was like. It was like completely military. You know, we were officers. I was once told to sort of smarten up, which, you know, is probably appropriate, but, um, you know... It, <laughs> Uh, and we, it was very hierarchical. Like, I remember there was a, we were on the ground, we were almost in the basement. We were kind of very much on the ground floor. Uh, and then the, the next floor was like the members' floor. And I remember, you know, the first day or two, I'm always a bit nosy, so I was sort of wandering up to see what, <laughs> what the members' floor was like. And, and people would say to me, what are you doing up here? You know, are you a senior officer? And actually, I was a senior officer, but I wasn't like a chief officer. And so I was, like, sent back. But luckily, you know, very quickly, um, the politicians, and this was a key moment of being against, but also about transforming, they were backing up the idea that, that, that all those hierarchies had to go. So not only we, us mere officers, would kind of be walking up and down those stairs, but the doors were open to the public. So, you know, this was like 22 miles of corridors. That's what GLC, the GLC was. But from an initial day or two where it was completely morgue-like and empty, the idea of somebody from the public being there was completely unthinkable. Uh, but, you know, very soon it was like just crowded with different groups of people from different parts of London all coming to put pressure on their councillors or consult with the, you know, the different units that were being set up. So there was a, a kind of transformation from the beginning. Plus, and this is something that you know, John knows he'll be up against, but in the GLC it was kind of still, it's significant. We, were, we faced enemies. You know, in our, we were, I was part of the economic policy group headed by the wonderful but sadly late Robin Murray, who should have a, a, a round of applause. Um, because he was, he, was, he was amazing. He was, um, I'm not going to be nostalgic, but I just have to a little bit. He was, he was incredibly creative and incredibly humble and supportive, but yet he'd been, he'd been brought up in this kind of, you know, semi-aristocratic, middle-class background. So he had great authority, you know, he could sort of, you know, when, when, and all these, a lot of the people, even the, the senior officers at the GSC were quite deferential. So Robin had an ability, you know, backed by the politicians to kind of put them in their place. Anyway, we were all kind of isolated at the bottom and... <clears throat> because we were seen as political appointees and slightly dodgy, we were given very small offices and not sufficient staff. And there was one particular officer who was completely hostile and undermined everything we did. But very quickly, you know, she was just got rid of. I mean, I don't think she was just thrown onto the streets, but she was, <laughs> she was put somewhere else that she could do less damage. Anyway, this was the context of being against the state <clears throat> but we were the key. The key point was that we all came from social movements. I was responsible for creating the popular planning unit, and our our staff, our first staff, were from the women's movement, Sheila Robotham, from the uh, shop stewards movement, Alan Haling, who worked for for Fords and had helped to create the combine committee in Fords, including linking up with the Fords stewards in Halewood. Um, people involved in community organising in Coventry and other places. Uh, John Howland sadly also died, but he was a sort of, you know, ex-68 sort of agitprop kind of hippie guy, you know, very, very creative, and she, he and Sheila edited a, a newspaper. So this was, we were a gang of people whose job it was to unlock the resources of the GLC to support social movements. And for me, in and against the state was re re represented symbolically by a tie, a tie, not a, um, a John Snow kind of tie or a John Landsman kind of tie or even a John McDonald satin tie. <laughs> it was like a sort of, it was like one of those string ties, but it was red and it was on a hook. And it was there because most of our, 
men, I mean, women weren't that smart either, but the, most of the men would, would never be seen wearing a tie. But in order to be in the state, we had to wear a tie. So in order to, to be effective in unlocking the resources of the GLC for the communities that we were supporting, we had to pick up that tie, the men had to pick up that tie, go to committee, and with the tie, had to present the case for, you know, hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but, but thousands of pounds, sometimes millions of pounds, to, to be given to um, movements, resource centres, people's plan centres across London. I once went, I probably tried to borrow a power jacket to get support to buy the Royal Docks from the Built of London Authority because we were, we were supporting the people's plan for the Royal Docks as an alternative to uh, the city airport. Uh, and so, you know, the logical, the power the GLC, it didn't have because that had taken it away. But in theory, we had the power to buy the land as, as we did with Coin Street, which was again in support of a popular movement that had a, an alternative that had resisted property developers, but a key principle of the popular planning unit was that where there's resistance, there's also a belief in something different, and there's alternatives. So we were supporting those alternatives and using the power of the GLC with resources, compulsory purchase, where we had that power, or procurement, contract compliance, the sort of past echo of what now is being done in Preston and many other councillors. Seeing every, we looked at every possible political lever we had through that state, the elected power of Ken Livingston and John McDonnell and so on. We looked at every power we had to, to use those powers to support popular initiative. So, having had a brief moment of, of nostalgic excitement, I will now try and <laughs> draw, draw some lessons. I'm sure John will draw more profound ones. But um, I think the first one, so I've just got to one was the importance of a collaboration between um, the elected politicians that were in, in theory in charge of the state uh, and the popular movements that had a knowledge and a productivity. We, we called what we were doing productive democracy and I'll explain a bit of that in a minute. But, but th there was a key collaboration there without which change was, was impossible. Um, I mean, the idea of productive democracy was the idea that, that actually um, workers' organisations, community organisations, had a kind of knowledge. It was a practical knowledge, a tacit knowledge, often backed up, too, by sources of theoretical knowledge, which the state lacked. So that when it came to, for example, the investment board that we, we set up, and we made public investments in order to save jobs, it was key that the, the workers, furniture workers, car workers and so on, were involved in that process, but through their independent trade unions, uh, because they had ideas about how those industries could be saved for public benefit. So we developed a very clear notion of, of, of on the one hand, of efficiency as public efficiency, as distinct from private profit, and also an understanding of democracy that wasn't simply about, you know, the formal processes or even the morality of democracy, was a, but it was about democracy you know, as something productive, as a kind of source of energy and innovation. Uh, and so it was that combination of representative democracy, but recognizing the limits. I mean, we'd seen it with Tony Benn. We'd all been influenced by those ideas of Tony Benn that just were completely undermined by the power of the city, the corporate power, the extra parliamentary powers of capital. And so the GLC was founded on a belief in the, in the, the positive, creative, productive capacities uh, of social movements. And I think that's been very much taken on board uh, by John McDonnell and, um, and, and Jeremy Corbyn. There's a real sense, particularly in John's economic policy, of that need to combine the powers of the state to, to, to take utilities back into public ownership with a commitment to involve workers and communities, the people that actually know how to change the social relations of those industries. Uh, uh, you know, that's crucial to the, the new policies. I think the other, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. So the other, the other lesson is the importance of, 
of recognizing the autonomy and, and independence of social movements. So we were, all, all of those of us involved in both supporting social movements and working with social movements were very wary of, we had a certain power because of our resources, but that was really important that that power was used neither to bring um, workers and, and communities into the state, nor to, to, to enable the state to dominate those, um, those social movements. So the autonomy and creativity of social movements, without which all this productive democracy would be impossible, was crucial to the ethic of our, our relationship with social movements. And then the third, and again, I think that's true. I, I think there are issues there now that need to be discussed. You know, I think momentum could play a key role. It could be the Labour Party's popular planning unit. I, it could be a resource for the for the social movements, and if it, it was, saw itself very much as looking outwards to support struggles, to, to try and you know, bring to bear the resources of the Labour Party to support struggles, rather than to dominate them. We'd all learnt from the limits of a Leninist kind of politics, the dangers of a sort of vanguard approach to social movements. Anyway, I won't, I won't go on about that, but we can discuss that. But then the, the final lesson that we learnt is the and maybe Anna is going to talk more about the limits of this, but the importance of transforming the state. So all the time, we were trying to, to change the state. And here, again, we, we learnt, I felt I learnt anyway, and Sheila too, Sheila Rebotham, that, that the lesson of the women's movement, that, that human institutions, are, are, even if they're bureaucratic and hierarchical, they depend on human beings who can refuse those institutions, and they can begin to create alternatives. So across the GLC was constant creation of alternative social relations, even, you know, to get things through the lawyers. We would, we would talk to the lawyers as human beings, you know, and I discovered the chief lawyer had been a scout leader or something, and he, we convinced him that he should, he should give the okay to, like, hundreds of thousands of pounds being spent on... Um, workers' education, on paying for workers to have time off so they could actually think about alternatives. And I mean, I'm sure John's got lots of other, other stories and we mustn't dwell on these stories, but that emphasis on the possibilities of transformation through creating new social relations in a way in resistance to the old. And it was a constant struggle, finalised by, you know, abolition. Uh, and so I think that that's... That, that's another lesson that also must apply to the Labour Party, that we, we have to transform the Labour Party. I mean, I'm not sure whether we'd say we're in and against the Labour Party. Sometimes it feels like that. But, you know, um, certainly uh, we've got to, at our moments of despair, recognise that these institutions, these are the parliamentary party, they're, they're pretty entrenched institutions reinforced by the lack of democracy of the British state. But on the other hand, they can be refused, and they, you know, that's where open selection, reselection, so on, becomes important. That we've got the capacity to make changes that can bring about the kind of transformation that we want. So that's a slightly rambling tour through in and against the state, but I hope it's of some use. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, that was great. That was. I really enjoyed listening to that. I'm Mark Sawatka. I'm the General Secretary of PCS. Uh, can I uh, apologise? Um, uh, we've got these mics. My hand may shake a bit as a result of my uh, heart transplant and the medication that I now have to take. Uh, and can I just say I'm only standing here because of our magnificent NHS. Uh, we should all uh, remember them. And, um, just as a... As a small plug, if uh, it's completely off topic, if anyone here has not signed up to be an organ donor, three people die a day because there's not enough organs, please consider it because it saves lives. Now I'm here talking um, as, as a representative of people who work for the state. Let's get that out there. I represent PCS workers, low paid civil servants who work in government departments. So we have a unique insight into the role of the state, how what the state does affects what everybody has to do day to day with work, how they are policed, how they are surveilled, and how if the state determines those people can be used 
to implement policies that are against the interests of the majority because the state wants to create a division between those, whether they be benefit claimants or those who are on the receiving end of dreadful Tory policies and those low-paid workers who are forced to administer them. So my starting point from the position that we adopt, it is only through unity of trade unionists and those working to deliver often services that they hate and those people who are on the receiving end, such as benefit claimants, anti-deportation sort of deportation campaigns, and those standing up for asylum seekers. Because that grassroots unity is the way that we can overturn much of the policies that the Tory government makes us implement. But if we're going to do that, we have to, I think, take full on and understand the role the state plays and the difficulty of what they're going to throw in our way. So let's start from our members currently. So our members have been in the news because they're having to sanction people who cannot exist on dreadful rates of benefit and have their benefits stopped for the most appalling reasons. We have members who were recently in the news because of the appalling deportations as a result of the Windrush scandal. We have members who work in tax offices who have seen at a time there is record tax avoidance and tax evasion, all resources into chasing down the tax dodgers being removed and those resources being focused in areas like the DWP, where they are chasing down people who may be talking about pounds and pennies, rather than the tax dodgers who are talking about millions and billions. So it tells us about the state. And let me be absolutely clear talking up for those people. Those people that we represent are so low paid that 40% of the workers working for the DWP claim the benefits that they have to administer. Now under universal credit, we'll have to sanction their own colleagues if they are not deemed to be doing more to increase, for example, their part-time earnings. And they have to work in communities where the things that they do is often questioned. Now my starting point has to be we must have unity in saying it can never be right to blame a low paid worker struggling themselves to exist for implementing the policies of a rotten Tory government. And I hope that everybody can coalesce around that basic position of unity. But I do want to be clear about this, that people hate now. I've just come from a meeting with John about why we need a proper social security system. And we had members there. Some of them worked for 30 years. They hate going to work. They hate going to work because what they are made to do. But many of them don't have the luxury of being in the city and moving from one investment bank to another and just deciding whether they're adding another note on their salary. There are no other jobs where they work. They are eking out a living. And we have to confront what the state makes those people do. Let me tell you this. The Windrush scandal, which saw politics at its worst, which actually saw Theresa May, who got found out, she is a racist politician who implements racist policies, as far as I'm concerned. And not only, not only I'm, I'm sure this will get me into the same hot water that Speaking Up for Palestine did last week, but let me say that uh, what she did was a conscious creating of a hostile environment designed to turn people into doing things that they loathe. Know this. The Home Office had targets for deportations. The Home Office have targets for deportations that they force their staff to meet. And a culture of a civil service that has senior managers take cakes into work to reward those people on teams who have met their targets should sicken us all. Because it tells us that what politicians who should know better are doing, how it plays out day to day. Because every deportation is a family life that is wrecked. That is somebody who has come to this country who has been forced out when they came here for something better. That's what the state is currently forcing low-paid workers to do. So we've got to understand the scale of the problem. We've also got to understand that this hasn't happened overnight and it is part of a politicization that sees the government want to shrink the size of the state as an employer by outsourcing to private companies who, by the way, have had 37 billion pounds worth of dividends to shareholders since 2010, so there's big money to be had. So it shrinks the amount of people it employs, privatizes to companies who often don't recognize unions, put people on dreadful contracts, and then it pays them by results. 
So we see the state here having a policy of saying to a firm, you can make money, but we will hold you to account by the results. And of course, the results they deliver is how many disabled people are they knocking off benefits? How many people are they part of locking up in privatized prisons? How many people are in asylum centers who are being locked up and treated like prisoners? These are the targets that the state now gets private companies to deliver for them. So this is very corrupt. It's very corrupting. And at the heart, it is how the state is operating through the Tories. So my opening point here is pretty simplistic. The best way to wreck what the state is currently doing is to see them, seize the moment and have the most radical Labour government that any of us will ever have seen in to overturn what we're currently seeing. And the beauty... The beauty of having people like John here and Jeremy Corbyn and the Shadow Cabinet is they know what they're walking into. They know, for anyone who hasn't read A Very British Coup, about all the obstacles that are currently being lined up to trip up the Labour government to ensure it can't carry out its radical overhaul of what is being done. That's why I think Labour understand what we understand, is you need a change of government, but what a radical government needs more than anything is radicalism in every community, in every workplace, from the grassroots up, to maintain this radicalism at the top by pressure from the bottom. And that's the key to transforming the state. Now, in bringing these few thoughts to a close, let's look, therefore, what the state will do to prepare for all of this. Recently, National Archives, under the 30-year rule, had to release papers that the press and we have crawled over. They're incredibly revealing. The government had a unit that was designed to track subversives across the country and in the civil service particularly. It decided there were 1,420 subversives in the civil service. They had a unit set up to ensure their promotions were blocked, they were sacked where they could be sacked, and we have had people whose lives were wrecked because they happened to believe in a fairer society. 50,000 people across the UK are in the files that were set up for blacklisting and for surveillance purposes. Companies who now get contracts from the government were paying in to organizations to keep this surveillance going. A number of years ago, it was called the Economic League. The Daily Mirror turned up at a Labour conference one year and you could pay a pound to see if you were on the Economic League blacklist. Believe you me, everybody was hoping they were on it. Uh, and I, I can tell you, I paid my pound and I was on it, and it reported that I led a strike in DHSS, Merthyr Tidville, in 1981, and I was now a risk to state security. Now, when this type of stuff is going on, doesn't it tell you... It tells you what we're up against. I just wrote to the Cabinet Office two weeks ago, saying we were very disturbed by these papers. Could they give us an assurance that old governments did that, but now there was no unit in any part of government who were surveilling and drawing up lists of subversives. And the letter we got back said, we cannot comment on what has happened in the past or what is currently happening, but it is not existing policy. Now that's as non-denial in my terms. But whether they've got these lists or not, I'm gonna share this with you. We have just won an industrial tribunal, employment tribunal case for a member of ours who worked in a government department in the DWP, low paid, who had a Twitter account, a Twitter account that did not mention anywhere that he worked in a job centre, was a union member, it just gave his name and his political beliefs. He issued one tweet in his account that said he hoped that Jeremy Corbyn would become Prime Minister because Britain needed better than the current lot. He was sacked. He was sacked because it was deemed to be contravening political neutrality rules in the civil service. That now means that we have wonderful left-wingers who've been selected to be Labour parliamentary candidates who have been told they have to give up their jobs and lose their income. Now think about that for a minute. When low-paid public sector workers have to choose to be a Labour candidate or feed their kids and pay their mortgage, what type of open democracy is that that the state is presiding over? It is trying to stop working-class people from our public services standing for election for something that they believe should be better. So I will finish by saying, whether it's that person who was sacked, and let me tell you, we won the employment tribunal for the member, but of course they won't be reinstated. They'll get compensation, but they've lost their job. It's a pyrrhic victory. But I tell you what I think we need. We need to understand the scale of what's going on. 
We need to understand our only grassroots campaigning and the different people at the top are going to challenge it. But we also need to understand this. When people tell us the civil service is neutral, it is neutral in the sense that lots of hard pressed men and women go to work because they want to try and make other people's lives better. But it's not neutral in what they are forced to do each day. And it's not neutral in this crucial respect that an incoming Labour government is going to have to grasp early on, which is the top of many civil service organisations are now stuffed with former captains of industry who come from the private sector with their private sector methods of operation that are imposing now on public sector workers their private sector ethos. That is not neutrality, that is trying to run the state for private profit. And I think if we have a Labour government, a Labour government that's going to radicalise the things the public sector does, it needs to ensure there's justice for the miners at Orgreave, the pickets at Shrewsbury, the people who have been <laughs> suffering for years. Because you have to put right the historical wrongs. It needs to look at the people on the lists and see if their careers were blighted. But it needs to say this, nothing will stop us from implementing a radical redistribution of wealth in this country, giving us policies that we can be proud to implement that connect government with the people. And we will do that by working with trade unions, campaigners, people in the communities from the bottom, with radical policies at the top. And our message is this, if the people put us in, and by God, I hope that they do, Nothing will stop us tackling inequality and poverty and this circus that has gone on for years that sees the rich profit at our expense. To do that, we need to be radical, understand what we're up against and be determined. And my union's determined with John and others on this platform on you to be part of that radical change. Thanks very much. I'm going to tell a story which is a little bit more modest and quiet. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware and how more than three years ago in 2015 in different uh, cities of Spain for the local elections, citizen platforms that were a mix of social movements together with uh, parties, new parties and old parties from the left presented and won. Uh, sit the government in cities such as Madrid and Barcelona and Zaragoza and La Coruña um, then participated in places like Valencia and Oviedo and actually won uh, the government in many other small cities and villages. I mean, this was a whole movement, a municipalist movement that was active in the whole of Spain and that in our case and part of uh, Aura Madrid is a platform that came out of the uh, confluence of uh, the party Podemos and um, uh, uh, social movement uh, platform called Ganemos Madrid and actually I have written uh, for Red Pepper uh, a story of how a bunch of squatters and uh, booksellers set up a platform that won the government of the capital of the country after 25 years of conservative government. What happened actually when we got into the government and we don't come from traditional institutional politics, we don't come from uh, an experience with institutions. As I said, we come from a very different space. Uh, and then we enter in this winter palace, right? And um, what we realized there and in the way that we wanted to move uh, forward a program that was radically uh, democratic and feminist and uh, based on social economy and the collaboration with the social movements and it had a lot of characteristics that actually uh, Hillary was explaining before of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the will of a progressive uh, local government. When What we realized when, when we were there and I've been uh, advisor to the city council for two years is that uh, there was this placard uh, many years ago, in 2011, in Puerta del Sol, in the camps. And it said, um, I'm not anti-systemic, I'm not anti-system, it's the system that is anti-me. <laughs> so, 
The point is that we actually had a similar feeling. It's not that we are anti the state, it's that the state is anti us. The kind of policies and the kind of programs that we struggled to implement at the local government in, in Madrid were faced with a logic, which is the logic of the state, that is Leviathanitic, hierarchical, binary, and segmentatory in all its places. This is a very deep logic that is applied, I mean, city governments in Spain, I don't know the case in the UK, but they are purely administrative. They don't produce law. They, they, produce, they produce the tools that actually relate with the territory, that relates with the people, that relates with real life. And this is a struggling all the time to put all this energy, you know, on, and in, inside these this pockets and inside this binary logic and inside this structure, you know, as Hillary said, of floors, of knowledge, of decision making. Uh, so the point is that when we want to implement a radical government and radical policies there, we see that using the instruments that we have in the state institutions are not enough. And we have to transform some of them, and we have to create some of them totally new. Because when you are in and against the state, you know, the, the against part is this, uh, you know, the logic that crosses everything. But when you're in and you're part of it, there is this performatic character that you have to behave like the state. But it's also the state is under attack and is, you know, under this privatization. Uh, attacks and the neoliberal attack. So you are actually working on two fronts at the same time. So you are actually defending yourself from the state and defending the state against the neoliberal privatization. And what we are trying to do is to create something new. And this was a discussion that we had had from the program all these years, and it has to do with the idea that you just manage it well. I mean, you get to the Winter Palace and then you say, okay, we're just going to do things right. We're going to do, you know, real social radical measures. Or what I think our um, idea was more is to try to create the less statal of the public institutions. To basically get this logic that traps, you know, the real life and dissolve it into something that is something different. And that it doesn't have to be strictly public as the state understands the public, but it has to be public as actually the common good understands the public. For example, in the re-municipalization of the public services is a very good example, because for us, it's not enough to say, okay, this, for example, water company in Barcelona has been right now, you know, is, uh, trying to be re-municipalized against Sahbar, which is part of Suez, which is like very big multinational. And, uh, but it's not enough to say, okay, we are going to run it again in this hierarchical, binary, segmentary, expertise uh, way, but to say, how can we implement ways to make it more democratic, to make it, it more common? Uh, similar things have happened to our, uh, with energy, for example, but also with, and if Francesca Bria will be here, she will explain much better with actually data and technology. How are we going to get back control of this? How are, we, how are we going to use the institutions, not as a way that we take and we govern, and we knew and we learned from the governments in Latin America that having the government doesn't mean to have the power. So how are we going to use all this social movement and all this uh, new common sense for a more democratic, self-organized society that was born out of the May 15, and turn it into a political power that can actually build the institutions and that can build the infrastructure that will allow people to actually gain control about the resources that they need for their lives. And in that, again, if we take the, the uh, technology sovereignty plan and, and data sovereignty that Barcelona is trying to implement, then we face the state again, and we face uh, statal institutions, and we face superstated institutions. This is something that we can, a city cannot do alone. I mean, it's not that the scope of the challenge is a little bit, you know, like, too ambitious. It's also that it depends on many different ways. So the cities are being, since we were in the governments in all these cities, 
we have been challenging many also rules that come, for example, from the austerity logic that comes from the fiscal compact uh, measures that actually in the city of Madrid are limiting our budget. So even if we have the money, we cannot spend it, which is actually like we cannot spend on social services the money that we do have. Uh, from that point of view, or for example, also limitations to the way that you can gain control again of infrastructures like water, because right now Barcelona is facing, I think it's up to now, 17 low cases from the uh, private company against this remunicipalization. Um, the uh, mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, comes from the anti-eviction housing movement, and she has in the door of her office, still up this day, in the city hall, uh, a notice that says, never to forget why we are here and where we come from. Uh, nothing, I mean, none of these policies that we want to implement could be possible without the existence of these social movements that are out there, but also without the willing to actually give them not only a space uh, inside the institution, not only a way to mediate with them, but actually to be able, and that I think is one of the things that the institutions are least prepared to do, is to give up power and to give up capacity of government and to give up resources. And this is a very risky move and it's a hugely radical move that I think, in my opinion, the municipalist movement in Spain is trying to do. So I think that what I would say in this question of in and against the state is that, honestly, it's not enough. It's, it's, the state has certain logics so far that are not up to the task. They are not ecologically aware enough, they are not complex enough, they are not feminist enough, they don't care enough about what is going on. So I would say it's in and against and definitely beyond the state. Thank you. It's not much else to say, really. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just take you out where I think we're at. Um, I see the debate as a natural evolution of the history of working class struggle to democratize our society and, and to exert power in, in to improve the living conditions and, and life chances of working people. And it's, if you look historically, it's, it started with working people coming together at the point of production. So in that very sphere which determined whether they survived or not, i.e. in the workplace, they came together and, and I suppose explored the appropriate way in which they could organize themselves to maximize their power and their attempt to have a say over the, their futures and their day-to-day -day lives just to be able to survive. And so the institutional form that they eventually arrived at two centuries ago was the trade union. And that gave them the ability then to use their collective strength to then exert influence and power in relationship to their employer. And also to actually start dictating some elements of their life. They, for the first time, they had some consistent mechanism for exerting control over part of their lives. And that was at work. And so, obviously what working people then did, well, well there's other aspects of our lives that we have no control over. So the wider community, our housing, our, our local community, what happens within that community, the support that we need when we're sick, when we need education, uh, how do we protect even then our environment. And so that naturally evolved into a discussion about what institutional form do we now need to exert power and influence and control over those parts of our lives. And so that naturally then, so the institutional form of the trade union where you come together as a group 
You elect representatives to speak on your behalf and you hold them to account. Well, that naturally evolved into, well, we need a political party to do that. If we're going to have, if we're going to have some institutional form that will also be able to exert our influence over what the wider aspects of life. So you can see the evolution of a conscious decision from the trade union movement to actually say, therefore, we need democratic representation um, in whatever form it was. And it's interesting because a lot of that democratic representation at the local level was electing people to education boards, water boards, and things like that. And there was a, a, a almost a, I suppose, a, a reticence to engage much beyond the, the local area, but nevertheless, that's what trade unions they built. Then you can see uh, the conscious debate that goes on, well, we need to go further, we need to go further because in, these are, uh, the, the representatives of capital, are the representatives of the employers, use parliament and the state against us. So how can we engage with some exertion of power with regard to the wider state, the national state in particular? So you can see how the evolution of the trade union movement into the formation of a, then a political party to then engage in assertion of influence and power over decision-making at the national level. And, I, and it's important to understand that history, I think, because then when the trade unions did decide to form a political party, um, the next lesson is about the nature of representation. Because initially it was individual working class, often working class representatives going into parliament and then the opportunity of even forming a government. And then the, there was an understanding then about the incorporation of elected representat representatives with the warm embrace of parliament and the state itself. And there's, there's some fantastic film of the first Labour cabinet and they're trying on their top hats. <laughs> because that's the form of dress that you would have to wear going to Parliament. Keir Hardy refused to, but the others didn't. And the film is interesting because they look as though they're enjoying it. <laughs> and the lesson, the lesson from that was the recognition of how readily individuals elected into positions could be so easily incorporated into the state itself. The lesson from that, uh, with the big split within the Labour Party in, in the 1930s when Ramsay MacDonald went off and joined the Tories and they set up the national government, the trauma from that taught people within our movement about the issue of incorporation. So then what happened was, of course, when the election of the Attlee government, the Attlee government was with, with elected people into position who actually had, many of them had gone through that trauma experience and therefore were determined to actually, I think in, in the most altruistic way, to use the vehicle of the state to bring about the transformation of the day-to-day -day lives of working people. And they used the model of the existing state to do it, what they knew, what they knew, the existing state, which, which <laughs> and many of them actually did come from military service as well. So they did do the, you know, the elected, the, the class of the elected member, the officer, and then the, the, the others to, the, to, to deliver at the sharp end. And so you got, for example, in the nationalised industry, you got the Morrisonian model. And, you know, the, now there's always that thing about the miners, you know, we nationalised them, we were unnationalised, we nationalised the mines, then the next day we thought, well, we own the place, then we looked around, it was the same bloody managers in place. And if that's, I think, with regard to the Atlee government, the lesson there was that they were so determined to transform and improve the working conditions, the living conditions of working people, they just went in there and they went to hammer this state. All right, we'll use the state as best we can. We know we've had that experience in corporation that took place in the 30s. We'll avoid that, but we'll don't go in there as a determined phalanx to actually force change through by using the mechanisms of the state. And to, if you look back on it, it was a huge success. It was a huge success for its time. And so the material, the, the material lives of working people 
were transformed. They were transformed in terms of the NHS, and Social Security, the commitment to full employment, the council housing program that was done. And that was all driven by an extremely centralised state because that government desperately wanted to transform lives quickly. But over time, what, what then happened is the, I think uh, over time what then happened is actually the Labour Party became reincorporated into the state, um, if you like, and become, became over time almost settled that this was as far as the, these were the limits that you could go to in terms of change within society and became comfortable with that political and economic settlement. And also, over time, continue to replicate the relationship of the state to working people. And in the 70s and into the 80s, and this is where age comes into it, I'm sorry about this, um, there was a view was actually the relationship between working people and the state is one of, actually is one of dominance. Um, it is centralised, it is statist, and actually, the politicians that we were elected through our systems are no longer accountable in the way that we wanted them to be. And as a result of that, in many ways, the, the, the person's experience, even of Labour governments at the time, was one in which they felt no control over their lives whatsoever. Um, and the physical benefits might still have been there, but they weren't in a way in which people appreciated that they had any sort of democratic power over them. Um, and it was, you know, I, I was born in Liverpool, we were born in the slums just off Scotland Road, we went into a council prefab, and you went into a council house and all the rest of it. Um, but that thing about council housing, I, I love the place that we lived, I absolutely I love the estate we were brought up and all the rest of it, and we were, we were, we were a community. But it was very statist, actually. You, you, you would only get in certain things from the local council. It would be a standardised relationship. It would be very much one in which there wasn't an awful lot of choice or democratic power or involvement. And when you went along to pay your rent, you were told that you cut your garden that week and all that, that sort of stuff, you know. And so people were feeling hemmed in and they thought, actually, increasingly we thought, actually, the state is dominating us rather than us democratically controlling the state. And that became evident in a whole range of... And especially when the economic conditions changed, um, particularly when in the 70s, and when the economic conditions changed, then the state was used then to exert control over ourselves. So instead of us being a movement, which was a progressive movement, controlling the state to improve conditions, all of a sudden the state was then being used to control us effectively, both in terms of reducing expectations of what was to be, what we could achieve, but also with the economic crisis that was taking place in the 70s and 80s, the withdrawal of some of those social benefits that have been won through struggle. So the relationship with the state then become one of dominance of the state of the individual, but then also one of tension between the individual and communities and the state itself. And that, that produced then the discussion about, in, in the movement itself, is where do we go from here? Um, because the, the way in which, in the past, we'd organised to get, elect people and then thinking by electing people we'd won and as a result of that those elected people would deliver on our behalf the services that we wanted or the improvements in our lives. That was no longer working. It was no longer working. The people we elected were completely cut off or unaccountable um, and then the state itself, instead of improving our lives, was actually withdrawing the benefits that we'd won over generations. And that's where the discussion came from. And the Edinburgh group met, and, and the, the first work that was, it wasn't just Edinburgh group, it was others as well, the first uh, way the work was being developed was just talking to people. So you sat down and you talked as council tenants about what life was like. You know, can't get the bloody repairs. Can't get the bloody repairs. The rents keep going up. And the litter's not being picked up. And the best thing, I, I can remember the story by... Um, Frank Dobson, he was canvassing and they were a big campaign against, um, against rearmament after uh, whatever. Um, and they were, they were knocking on doors. He always tells the story, he was in a tower of flats in, in Camden. They were knocking on doors and they, they knocked on some door and they said, said to a woman, um, 
you know, our campaign, we're campaign against rearmament at the moment and all the rest of it is absolutely critical. We could be, you know, we don't want another world war and all that. She said, I fully agree with you, but could you stop them pissing in the lift? <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it was like that material, you just felt completely out of control. And it was the same when you went to a benefit office. So we talked and people talked to benefit claimants. What was it like? Well, I went in there and they treated me like shit. It was like that. So you talk to people about you know, what was happening, bus routes, you know, is your bus route, does the bus come on time? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but I don't know who to talk to. Them. So it, was that, it started a really grassroots discussion about what was your life like and do you have any control over it? And increasingly, you just get that feedback. Actually, no, it's deteriorating rapidly because the first waves, then in the 80s, the first waves of monetarism, all the cutting back. But in addition to that, you just had, you felt you had no control whatsoever. So what was emerging then, it came from 68 as well, and what was emerging then was a view, look, that's, the state exists, the only way we're going to get our hands on the power and resources is of course to go into the state, so that means either you get elected or you get employed, and then once you're in there, you need to actually then be against the way it's operating, and you have to transform it, and that was the discussion. Um, and it was almost like you get elected and you think, what are we going to do now? You know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and the issue for us was to recognise and talk to people to say the state, yes, is a set of institutions, but it is a relationship of dominance. Once we got that agreed and people understanding that, then you could unleash the creativity in people. And, it, and the GLC, basically what happened was is that we... We took a view, let's, uh, the GLC in those periods, I, I represent now to London Borough, as uh, runs constituency, the GLC for us really was pretty meaningless. I mean, it ran transport, fire brigade, and that sort of thing. And often the person we'd send up there, it's almost like sending someone to the House of Lords, you know, just to get rid of them. Maybe that's why they elected me, I don't know, but there you are. Uh, <laughs> but we took a decision in, we took a decision in 79, or whatever, that the GLC, after Thatcher got elected, the GLC, was the next major election after Thatcher. We took a decision that we wanted to run left candidates, and those left candidates have had a coherent view about how we went into the state and how, against the state, we transformed it. We drafted up a huge manifesto, um, which actually went into detail, so much detail on individual policies. The manifesto was drafted on the basis of Excel absolutely exhaustive and exhausting discussions with everyone you can think of, anyone who had any idea, groups would meet, they'd draft them up, there'd be working groups buzzing all the time, and that was the manifesto that we went into on in, in uh, 81, and we got elected, um, and immediately then took the view that what we do now is, is exactly as, uh, as Hillary said, we go into County Hall and we just open up the doors, we open up the doors. And literally in County Hall, the, the anecdotes flow out. But every night, what, the first floor is the members' floor, and it's beautiful wooden panels, isn't it, really? And it's a huge circle. In fact, my kids used to roll the skate around it. Anyway, it's a, every room was a wooden panels and all the rest, wasn't it? And it was. It had a dining room. And so, oh, it's just incredible. It was, it was like the Winter Palace, actually. Um, we opened up every room. And every night, anyone could come along, I, I want to book a room, I want to talk about it. And every night, it was buzzing. And you'd have one group, I, we had, I set up a radio forum, and, and we had, there were no legal, legal radio licenses at the time. But this was a group of people who had set up their own radio stations. One guy was broadcasting from a tree on Hampstead Heath. <laughs> and they were talking about how we communicate, because radio was the most effective time of them. We'd have another group that was talking about prostitution and women, King's Cross, the air, and all the rest of it. We'd have another group talk about how it was accountability of the police and all the rest of it. We had another group who was working on the impact of the Prevention of Terrorism Act on the Irish community. Every night, there'd be a discussion going on about what was happening and all the rest of it. And people would then emerge with their ideas about how, and democratically discuss them, call together, emerge with their ideas drag the politicians in, the elected members in, and say, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to do. How do we do it? Now, the issue there for us, and this is, I think, key for us as we go into government now, you can, ha you can open the doors, you can have those discussions, but if you haven't got the technical ability to understand how the existing state operates, 
you're able to be frustrated at the first stage. And there's an element in which actually you have to get serious about how those reports are written. What legal advice do you need? Does it stack up finance? So some of those traditional roles have to be fulfilled as well, but they have to be challenged every time. So what would happen, Hillary would come along with some madcap scheme of buying a factory or something like that. <laughs> it would come to my finance committee. The finance officers actually were very good, but, and I discovered afterwards, Morris Stonefrost, who was the director of, uh, after abolition, I never knew these stories, but I, he was a kid and his family would go on the bus and the children would have to walk because they never had the money to pay the fares. And they, so inbuilt in some of these people was automatically a view of wanting to transform this. But we went through the process, and every time a report would come up to my committee, I would get almost, on any major expenditure, I'd get a legal challenge for one of the groups. Economic League was one of them, actually. And what we were able to do then, we were able to ensure that we opened up the state to people with their ideas and their discussions, etc. But those people with those ideas then harnessed the expertise and the representative abilities and powers of the elected members and the officers. So all of a sudden, the vehicle was transformed and it was being driven democratically by the community itself. And where we had bodies um, that were delivering, external bodies delivering, all of a sudden we used our power of appointment to put them on. We appointed a guy called Ernest Rodker to London Transport Board, and he turned up for his first meeting. They said, who are you? He said, well, I'm an anarchist from South London, but I'm a passenger as well. <laughs> and, so, and he was... <laughs> And he was there to make sure we had a reduction of fares policy and designed a structure on the basis of passengers. And, the, and it was exhilarating. And there were, yeah, there were cock-ups, of course, course there were. But it was absolutely exhilarating because all of a sudden people felt empowered. But then also, we took the view actually to empower people, you do need to resource them. And that's why we had an ambition for every community at that stage that there would be a trade union resource centre, there would be a law centre, there'd be a women's centre, and then for communication in those days, as shows you goes back to, it goes back so far really, we also would have a print shop available to people as well to see if they could do a community newspaper. And we were, we were not parachuting these things into communities, we were saying, here's a menu of things, if you want them, we'll fund them and get them in. Uh, and, that, and literally it was an effervescent, dynamic period and you can see why Mrs. Thatcher abolished us. <laughs> because at that point in time, monetarism, the sort of first stage of neoliberalism, was being implemented by central government. And here you had an institution that suddenly had been taken over, opened up, and was empowering people to resist the imposition of these policies by central government. And that could not be withstood by the central state, and certainly the central state under a Tory like Mrs. Thatcher. And that's why they abolished us. They got rid of us because we were such a challenge. And remember, this simultaneously what was going on was the miners' strike as well that we were trying to link up with as a result of the rate capping campaign. I actually think the final thing that, that pushed her over the edge as well is that County Hall faces Parliament. So when MPs used to go on a terrace for a cup of tea, we would put the London unemployment figures up on the top of our <laughs> So when Mrs Thatcher went for a cup of tea every day, every day, I actually do think it pushed her over the edge completely. <laughs> what, what then? Um, so, finally. I'm so, uh, sorry, I, I'm rambling here, aren't I? Look, um, so, I, that was a lesson for all, that was a lesson for all of us, though, of what you can do, but you recognise actually there is the, the power and influence of the central state uh, has to be addressed. So the evolution from that then was to recognise that municipal socialism and the development of it is great and terrific, but it has to be complemented by actually um, socialism which is developed on a scale of the nation state and then you start developing and beyond that. I don't believe in socialism in one country. We tried that and it didn't work. Um, but it, you can see the evolution of thought, can't you? So we're now at that stage where we go into government, but we go into government with those same principles. And it is exactly as Jeremy said, you know, we, we take power to give power. And what we've got to do now, and this is all the detailed work that we, we're doing now and need to enhance as well, 
is how do we go into, into the national state and be against the national state in the sense of dispersing power throughout the community. And you can see the work that we're doing to try and do that. My treasury team on the economic front, and working Becca Long Bailey, who's brilliant from the business team, is all about economic power and economic rights and democratising our economy. And you can see how we're doing that, the development of the cooperative sector, the right to buy for workers when companies are sold on. Um, the, as you saw yesterday, uh, which, <laughs> as you saw yesterday, the evolution of the policies in terms of being stakeholders within company, uh, workers being stakeholders within their own companies as well. And then looking at how we can use public procurement to promote um, the, the cooperatives and worker-owned enterprises, etc. Then how we can um, reintroduce real trade union rights back into this country to give workers power within the within their workshop as well. <laughs> then, then on the then as we bring the public utilities back into public ownership, ro to rail, energy, water, Royal Mail how we set up the structures then to ensure that they're managed just yes, by expert management, by the workers themselves, by passengers, customers too, and representatives of the community, and the consultation, all those papers are out there now, so that people can have their views on how that's best done. And then the next stage of that process is then, is how do we look at the, the role of local government in particular, how do we resource it, open it up, make it more democratic, etc. So what we're doing now, literally, is it, as we go into government, making sure that we're engaged in the discussion and debate about how we open up national government now, every level, in terms of democratic, democratic engagement and control. And that's a huge, absolutely huge exercise that we've all got to participate in. And we'll only succeed if there is high levels of participation. So actually, there's no pressure, there's a responsibility on all your shoulders to get involved in this process as well. But just finally, so you can see the evolution of how we've got where we are. About the, uh, uh, it's a, it is about the extension of democratic rights. But of course, uh, you can see the evolution of the next discussion too, which is, and I mentioned it yesterday, this has to be in the context of what we do in terms of internationalism and the global institutions that we want to establish as well. And that's why I said yesterday, next spring we're going to do this social forum type event where we link up with politicians, international politicians, economists, civil society representatives as well, to talk about the, the networks that we need to establish internationally to, to in, change the debate that's taking place about global power in particular, but then also to sustain the developments that we will be undertaking in, in our individual nation states as well. And I think that's a huge debate that's got to be had um, because when we go into government, uh, we want to ensure that when we go into government, we're learning lessons from each other across the world about what works and what doesn't work, how, what we can do, but also that we reinforce each other with the building up of a global movement rather than just a national movement that we're on at the moment. So, um, get busy. <laughs>
um, well, the workforce are, are lacking in skills. You need new people to come in who've got, who are technoed up, that know how to use computers. We need whiz kids graduates. So we're going to um, reorganize the, everything, all the departments um, and get rid of the old guard because they don't know what they're doing, the workers. So you managers make sure that um, you recruit graduates. Now to me, in this new state that we're look, look, looking towards, is it really that important that we have um, older workers that are computerized and technical or is this just an excuse by this lady that was appointed by the Tories? So, um, there is a gentleman, I think, in the fifth, fourth, fourth row, just there in the middle. And, and then there's a lady with glasses with a red top. There, that's perfect. Yeah, um, so, I'm a RNT shop steward. So, my question is, in the early 70s, it was very much a case of the sort of social movements and the rank and file base was there but a Benite government never happened. Over the intervening 30 years, like the cuts and neoliberalism, are we at risk of ending up in the reverse situation where we have a Benite government, but we don't have a level of like rank and file activism and consciousness that can hit it? So for example, I can think of workplaces where if you brought in workers control, you'd end up creating six new positions filled by the same three people. So what is a movement can we do to ensure that when this opening up of the state takes place, we're ready to take full example, um, full, full advantage of it for the short time we'll have it. And the, th the third question, third question from the lady in the red top uh, in, with the glasses. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, right. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, a CLP secretary now. I joined the Labour Party when, when Jeremy got on the ballot paper, but I used to be part of the Defend Council housing campaign. There are tenant activists around the country who are sitting there going, we, we know what we want, you know, we know what we want of this new Labour Party and of, 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 this, of the Labour government that's going to come. You know, please... I know this, I kind of want to say this to John McDonnell and he's gone, but you know, you guys talk to him. Um, please go and talk to them. There are, you know, all for years and years that we spent fighting the privatisation of council housing. So many tenant groups put really good, concrete, alternative suggestions of what we can do for our homes. You know, when they wanted to come and demolish an estate, tenants would have a plan for how we could just refurbish it. Um, you know, when they wanted to privatise the management of our homes, you've got councils and tenants getting together and saying, let's set up an in-house management organisation. There are loads of really good ideas out there. There are groups who want to contribute to this process. Please, please ask them. Um, so, just very quickly, in, in reverse order, our, our union's been affiliated to defend council housing for, for a long time, and uh, I think that's a really, really important point, and not enough people talk about council housing, the need to build council housing, and uh, I think we've got to put that firmly on the agenda. Obviously, I can't speak for the Labour Party, but I, I can just say to you, I've just been at a meeting with John and Margaret Greenwood on social security. And yesterday, a lot of people, probably because of the Brexit stuff, may not have picked up the significance of Margaret's speech, where she confirmed that Labour will get in, they will scrap sanctions, and that they will immediately open up a consultation with the people who deliver the service, the people who use the service, whether they be disabled, single parents, the people who need Social Security to develop the system we need. If that's the model that they're using on social security, it's got to be the right model to use in terms of housing and everything else, and I, and I, and I completely um, agree with that. On, on the question here for my, my colleague in PCS, I have no doubt 
the government department after government department is doing what you say. They use this excuse of upskilling and we need people with the new tools and they're actually trying to remove people who've been there a long time. They're losing skills and expertise. They try to save money in the process and they try to undermine the trade union traditions that when some people like me started in 1980, at 16 I joined the union on day one. And it is a very systematic attempt to undermine the existing workforce and we have got to be standing up to defend those people and it's not coincidental at the same time they're doing it, they're trying to cut people's redundancy terms by 33% to not only get rid of experienced staff but to also do it on the cheap and, and we've got to challenge, uh, challenge that. And the last point I'd say to the comrade from the RMT, I mean, I think that's a fascinating point. In the trade unions, uh, I, I can tell you that there is a tendency uh, across the trade union movement that people often have really strong rank and files in trade unions, then the left wins control of the union, and then suddenly those organisations diminish because there's a feeling where we've got people at the top. And that is a travesty if we let that happen, because the point I think we all agree with, you need radicals at the top, but they must be sustained by activists who can hold them to account and keep this as a, as a continuing process. And that must be the same model that we use in terms of the way we're debating it. I thought John's speech was fascinating in taking us through some of the historical issues that we're going to have to deal with. But I'm clear, uh, you know, we can have a debate personally, I think we should hold our politicians to account. I think the current first-past-the-post system is absurd. I think we need a complete radicalisation of the way we participate in politics. But at its heart has to be the accountability and constant renewal. And I think your point is a good one, because if we nationalise all the industries tomorrow, point John made is right. The people who will be running them are the same people if we're not careful, and there has to be a thorough democratisation right the way through, which does mean workplace democracy is absolutely key. OK, well, maybe starting with the housing question. Uh, and I really, I've always had huge admiration for Defend Council Housing because it's, it's also succeeded. It did, it did gain some real victories just through just persistent hard work and through reaching out to tenants' organisations and bringing them together. And I think, it, you know, just because we've now got such a brilliant leadership, the, that, in a way, it's, it's a reason for that effort to continue with greater effort because there's greater hope. And I think that... You know, in a way, John's method of, of really involving people and building a process, you know, he's, he went into detail at another session about how Saturday after Saturday, he and his team are, are helping to convene meetings in different town halls in different communities uh, to really shape not only the content of industrial policy, but also help stimulate the power, the counterpower that will be needed in the face of industry. And I think the same... That same methodology needs to apply to housing and to other areas. And I think, I don't know exactly who the shadow minister is, but if they're not sufficiently strong, and clearly there are a lot of rather weak MPs at the moment, but, you know, I think that, that you, you know, I don't want to put it back to you, but the, the Defend Council Housing needs to bring the tenants groups together and then say to the, um, the, the housing, shadow housing minister, maybe CCing John, oi, you know, come to us, come and hear what we're saying. We've actually had these ideas for, for months, for years, because we've been fighting on this issue. Are you going to implement them? So I think, in a way, we, the lesson from Greece, for example, is that too much reliance went into the leadership of Syriza. Okay, they're going to win, they, they've won, you know, we, we, the movements can sort of stand back a bit. But I think the lesson from that is that actually the movements need to intensify their, their, their organisation and their, their pressure and their initiative. It's a, form of, it's a way of supporting uh, a Labour government, but it's, it's also a way of being able to build the real power to back that Labour government against the huge pressures they're going to face internally as well as, as, well as from the state apparatus and from the interests of capital. And I think, I mean, that links in a way to the answer to the RMT Comrade, because I think that it's true that in the 70s with Tony Benn, it was the self-confidence and, and organisation and strength of those shop stewards committees that inspired him and that he supported them in, in their struggles. 
But this time, in a way, it's almost the other way around, that we've got a political leadership that is inspiring and giving confidence to workers' organisations. You know, again and again, workers are taking strike action because, and partly because, they know they've got a, a real voice in, in, the, in the leadership of the opposition. And so I think we've got to think, how can that be replicated in every locality? How can the Labour Party become a means of helping to organise and support struggles? I mean, in Hackney, where I live, you know, we're supporting the um, equity, I think it's like back to workers who are fighting um, the Picture House Corporation, which is refusing to recognise them, you know, paying them, paying them really low wages and, and so on. And so we're seeing ourselves as a, you know, we're on the picket line, we're, we're a resource for that struggle. And I think the Labour Party's got to play that role in helping to, 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 to in a way, prefigure the restoration of trade union rights by itself supporting trade union rights in, through direct kind of action. Well, I think this... Well, I think that we have two options here. And one option is like, you have all this grassroots group and all this knowledge about the specific cases and the council housing, and that you struggle to actually be recognized, you know, like this knowledge and this power goes up, and then you struggle for the national party to recognize it. Or we can go the other way around, which is let make the government to actually give more power to the local organization so that they can self-organize. And, and I think we need both. And I think if, if, the want, if you, we don't want to actually repeat the mistakes of the past, it's not only a question of controlling. It's not only a question of that the politicians in charge are accountable. It's just that they are able to actually give up their capacity of governance to the people. And that is too very different <laughs> strategies and it's two different organizations. So I do not agree as a municipalist that there is you know, a first scale where you try to open up a government at a local level and there is a natural scaling up and if you want to get farther then you have to go to this state level because otherwise you know, if we follow this logic we wanted to take size of the U ONU. UN, but it's not the case. So each scale has its own tools, and we cannot pretend to use the same tool for everything. A scale matters, and it matters in terms of organization. It's incredibly difficult to actually make a democratic uh, governance at the national level. It's much, much easier to make democratic instances and, and organizations at the territorial level. So if we want a real democratic organization, we have to push up the capacity, the decision making and the power to do things and the resources to the level where democracy is possible. And that is much more at the local level. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. We are running out of time. I'm going to try to take a couple more questions. Anna's remarks there lead me neatly on to mentioning that my colleague uh, Adam Ramsey has written a, um, an, a pamphlet which is available at the back which looks at exactly this question of constitutional design, how you bring power back to the people through the institutional repertoire of the state. So they're, they're available for a pound. Do pick one up on the way out. We've got plenty of stock left and it's nearly over. Um, so let's have a couple more questions and we'll, uh, we'll answer them as fully as we can given the time we have. Um, we may get kicked out. So where are the roving, roving mics? We've got one there? Brilliant. So the gentleman there, um, on, on the right hand side, just by you. Okay, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it, my name's Norman Thomas. I'm the vice chair of South Thanet Labour Party. Um, when Jeremy Corbyn came to Margate, to this, that's our area, uh, on his incredibly successful campaign to become leader of the Labour Party, I asked him then, did he have a plan as to what he would do if the Labour Party tried to nobble him. Um, he didn't actually exactly answer me, um, but we've seen what's happened. But what I'd like to ask the panel is, is what can we do to stop the state nobbling the Labour Party after they come into government, as the state will inevitably, inevitably try to do? That's it. Okay, so what can we do about the state? Let's have a couple more questions. 
Um, gentleman in the red t-shirt in the, the middle there. And then there's a gentleman right next to him. And I'm afraid, sorry, that's, we're going to take three, so. That's, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll, this, well, the whole conference and the, uh, the fringe events that, we, that I've been to. Uh, tremendous uh, to hear from all the speakers. Um, I've just got a bit of a question, because, uh, and it relates a bit to what the comrade from the RMT was saying earlier about in the 1970s, workplaces were very much different to the ones that, that we, we uh, have today. You know, there were many people organised in big workplaces, and I mean, Marx Union, they still are, in my own union, Unison, they still are, there's still some big workplaces, but there's many, many other uh, workers now in the gig economy, in small, uh, fragmented workplaces, and should the unions be reorganising themselves so that they are more based in the communities, and I know there are one or two unions that do a bit of that, um, where, you know, the, the, rather than you go into a, a workplace trade union meeting, you go to a local town union meeting uh, where, you know, all your comrades from different workplaces are organised rather than organising on a shop-by-shop -shop basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Thanks to me. Um, Kevin Nealon from Plymouth, and, and actually I wish John was still here, because in the 1980s I was in Basildon, where the council was known by some of the tabloids as Moscow down the Thames, uh, as we attempted to democratise the town. Um, I mean, my question is really about the, you know, how, how we link democratising the Labour Party uh, to democratising society, because I've always fervently believed if we can't have a properly democratic Labour Party, how can we trust, how can other people trust us to have a democratic society? Um, so we've had a debate this week, or several debates this week, um, around the democratisation of the Labour Party, and, you know, some gains and some big dis dissatisfaction. And, and my question is, how far can we take that, and how fast do you think we can take that? Um, where I live in Plymouth, for example, no criticism of man, but the leader of our Labour group has only faced one election in over 20 years um, as, leader of the Labour, as leader of the Labour group and therefore leader of the council. I don't think that's good enough. That's not very democratic. Um, a majority of our MPs will never face a proper contest based on, on what's happened this week. Um, so how far and how fast can we go and what can we do as activists to make it happen? Do you want to crack on with that? Because I know you, you've got to go very soon, so... Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I apologise, I'm doing a, a very important fringe on neurodiversity and I, and I, I don't want to be late. Um, can I say I've really enjoyed the meeting, I've been fantastic. So I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, throw my three pennies worth in, starting in reverse order. Um, I believe absolutely that everybody who's elected should be held accountable. Uh, I think the current processes by trying to deselect MPs are extraordinarily complex and difficult and allow people to run rings around party activists. And to my mind, no job should be uh, a job for life when you're elected. And in that sense, I think all elected people must be constantly held to account for the people that they represent. And, um, uh, so I, I do link the two. I also link that wider to reform of our electoral system. I just want to make this case. Uh, my union strongly believes in proportional representation. Lots of people think, oh gosh, yeah, that's, that's for anoraks and all the rest of it. But I'll just make this point that all of the things we talked about today done by the Thatcher government were all done with less than 50% of people voting for them. We have a system where you can live in various parts of the country and your vote doesn't count. And when that happens, it doesn't just mean those people are disenfranchised. It has the consequence that you've mentioned there. I was born in a place where my mother told me when I was very young that Labour can stand whoever they want. She actually said they could stand a donkey, put a red rosette on and they will win. The effect of that means that the Labour politicians who are elected treat their own constituents often, not always, but often with a contempt because they know whatever they do they will get back in. That cannot be healthy for either party democracy or for people's democracy. So I think we should have votes at 16, we should have a system where everybody's vote actually counts and it should be based on 
accountability should not be something that we think about every five years. It should be a process that is ongoing and, and complete. If we apply that to politics and unions and to society, we'd be in a far, far um, healthier place. And I, and I, and I just wanted to, to make that point. The final point I wanted to make, and I'll leave this to, to the other questions, is this question of democracy is vital because we talked about nationalized industries. Uh, British Steel and the Coal Board were nationalised when Thatcher used Sir Ian McGregor, who she brought in to run them, to reduce the steel industry from 200,000 workers to less than 80,000, and to reduce our coal mines from 170 to 17. So the fact that they were nominally owned by the public under a Tory government, with hatchet people that she employed, meant that she attacked them. This for us must mean we want real public ownership. We need the management, the operation of all our institutions done under public ownership. Workers should have a say in that. And part of that, and my key to this, has to be that we open up, repeal all the anti-trade union laws in this country that we have had since the 1980s. Not just the last lot, but the complete set. Because when you have true democracy in a workplace, you begin to bring about that fundamental change at workplace as well as community level. And the fact of the matter is, and I'll leave you with this, we have just had a ballot where 85% of our members voted to strike, but we didn't beat the 50% threshold. Because they're only allowed to vote by post, and we have a level of membership who move constantly because of low wages, they don't tell the union they've moved. We had an employer who wouldn't let us put a single poster on a notice board, wouldn't let any union rep talk to anybody in work time, and we had people leafleting outside, physically removed by security guards. That is a systematic attempt to block workers' democracy, so we need to repeal all of those laws, grow the trade unions, and not just in the old ways, but actually look to the inspiration of cleaners in SOAS, the MOJ, workers at McDonald's, TGI Fridays, and Weatherspoons in the gig economy. And my last point as I leave is the trade unions as a vehicle to change can be some of the slowest institutions going. So we need to provide some of these ideas in our basic labor movement structures. And if we do that in the politic political situation that currently exists, isn't it exciting? And let's make sure we seize the opportunity. Thank you and sorry for having to leave. I'm sure there's a woman wanting to ask a question there. Do you want... Is there a yeah. Can I just say thank you to all the people for your presentations? I just want to make one complaint about the unions. They talk about supporting the workers. Every individual in this country is a worker, whether it be present day workers, retired workers, unemployed workers, too mentally ill to work, and the children yet to work. So everybody's a worker. So let's not separate people and say, these people are working and those aren't, so they're less than. The unions should support every individual in this country. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but also I wanted to say Mark's gone now, but I think he's a, a sort of exemplary trade union leader because not only does he advocate democracy and advocate it in terms of the political institutions with proportional representation and so on, but also in, and in the Labour Party, but also in his union, he practices it. So actually the PCS is one of the most effective unions. I mean, there's a really close connection between a, a truly democratic participatory union and a union that has real power and efficacy and a real ability to represent communities as well as workers. So I think it's pity he's gone, but I just think that's important to remember. And I think in answer to the point about should the unions go beyond the workplace, uh, and I think they should. I mean. In the, in the 70s and 80s, trades councils were very important bod bodies that did help to bring together workers across communities, including workers that were disorganized. And I think that, that some unions are doing that now. I mean, I, you know, the problems with Unite, and it's a classic example of the, the slowness of democracy and the, and, and the problems of trade union bureaucracy. But, you know, their community branches, in my experience in Hackney, have been very 
important in supporting groups like the, the Back to Workers at the Picture House, or I found myself on the picket line defending parking wardens, you know, which are a very dispersed group of, of workers, but, you know, they were going on strike and, and the community branch supported them. So those community-based branches, as long as they see themselves as about workers' organisations, not just about, you know, changing the Labour Party or getting Unite, you know, candidates through or, you know, they, they actually see themselves as organisations of struggle. And the more unions that do that, um, the better. I think, what was the other question? There's a question about what, what can be done to protect the Labour Party once again. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the key thing about the Labour Party is, is its ambiguity that historically it's actually been a real buffer against the power of struggle. It's been a kind of protection of the existing state. I mean, you know, uh, John described it, you know, and he described the sort of aristocratic embrace of the Labour Party and the way it, it did become incorporated and not only became incorporated, but became a means of diffusing. You know, I remember in the, under Wilson and under Callaghan, the Labour Party was a way of diffusing industrial militancy. And that was because of the sort of opaque, indirect forms of representation and the lack of a real direct connection between working class people and their organisations and their representatives. So it was like this sort of block. And in a way, what we have to do now and what people here are, and in CLPD and in, in parts of Momentum are trying to do, and Jeremy and John in particular, are trying to unblock that process and turn the Labour Party into a direct voice for working class struggle and working class organisation. And that's what we've got to bear in mind when we support open selection and changes in the Labour Party to make it as directly accountable to working class people who are engaged in struggle as humanly possible. And I'm afraid we're, we're um, <laughs> we've come right out to the limits of time. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for what I think was a hugely important panel discussion and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.